Anyway, okay, so we'll get going here, everybody. Um, again, I hope everybody can hear me and see me. And so on behalf of the 2021 Merrimack River Eagle Festival, uh, my name is Ranger Matt Poole, and I'm coming to you from Mission Control here in South Berwick, Maine, which is my cutesy name for my home office. Uh, but I'm with Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, where I serve as the visitor services manager and um, do a lot of photography, which is why I'm doing this program today. But we are in equal partnership with the Massachusetts Audubon Society. So I want to thank them for partnering with us yet again this year for the Merrimack River Eagle Festival. And also want to acknowledge the stalwart support both today and on an ongoing basis uh, from our friends group, the Friends of Parker River. National Wildlife Refuge. They're a great support group, support pretty much everything we do. I do want to read or reread, Melissa, this is the same thing I read that you handed me on Tuesday night. So here we go. So we cover all the bases. Thanks for coming to one of our special 2021 Merrimack River Eagle Festival presentations. The 16th annual celebration of bald eagles and New England winter wildlife is presented by Parker River National Wildlife Refuge and Mass Audubon's Joppa Flats with thanks to our generous sponsors, Newburyport Bank and Trust Partners, Boston Partners Financial Group. So that's the, uh, the intro. And I think we're on the tail end of the Merrimack River, the Merrimack River Eagle Festival. It's been ongoing for a week. Typically in years past, this has been on a single day on a Saturday. So why are we doing photography? Where did that topic came from? Well, when Audubon and the Refuge got together several months ago, um, and came up with this idea of putting it online as well as some live in-person events. Um, they scheduled Parker River for a couple of slots. And uh, one we did was very popular last Tuesday night. It was about coyotes. We had a live uh, expert um, talking about coyotes and I think we had about 120 people or so. And then I just kind of threw out this idea of doing winter photography because that's kind of my passion. And um, I think it's a time of year when a lot of people probably don't take their cameras out or don't take themselves outside as it's kind of cold and for some uncomfortable. But um, my goal here over the next uh, half hour to an hour, and I don't know how long this is going to take, I'll tell you right now, because this is a brand new lecture that I just finished working on this morning, believe it or not. But the goal is to, if you're not already tuned in and turned on to winter photography, to get you to reconsider that if you're not. And so what I'm gonna do here is uh, be working from a, essentially a narrated slideshow. And uh, so I hope uh, a lot, if not all of what I am gonna cover here, uh, beginning in just a second um, is of interest and makes sense. Um, we will mute everybody just because we have a lot of folks here, we got 105 and counting. So that's a really good turnout. Thanks for coming by the way. Um, but at the end of this, <clears throat> after the final slide, I'm willing to uh, shut up and read whatever questions you feel like uh, typing into that chat box and I'll do my level best to uh, uh, give you an answer that maybe makes sense. So um, I'm gonna somewhat inelegantly just take a moment here and pause and share the screen, which means I need to go into my PowerPoint and activate that. And then I will come back and uh, start talking about all of this with all of you. So let me hit the projection button. And uh, again, it would be helpful to me if some of you can, uh, I, can I can see a few of your faces. If you could give me the high five, uh, high five sign that you're seeing uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, great. So we're gonna get going here. So the goal here, again, is just to give you a little bit of insight, some tips, tricks, and techniques. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are photographers already. You know, indeed, what is a photographer? Anybody that picks up a camera and points it at something and enjoys that activity, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a photographer. So here we go. So it's baby. So the, re the reasons for why winter may be a challenging period or winter photography, winter photography may be challenging to some folks. Why is that? Well, they all quote, baby, it's cold outside. Not everybody likes cold weather as much as everybody else. Um, um, I can't wait for winter every year. Some of you probably can't wait for it to uh, leave, the, leave, the, leave our environs. So there's that for sure. Um, 
there are, I think there's this perception that there are fewer animals around. Um, as you'll see, I think uh, that's not necessarily the case. There are actually more animals around than, than I realized before I, until I started collecting images for the slideshow. So there is winter wildlife. It's out there to be seen and photographed for sure. The days are short and I work. Well, I can, I can definitely understand that worldview because the days are short and I tend to, because I have about an hour drive to get to work, I'm often driving to work in the dark and driving home at the end of the day in the dark. And so that doesn't, during the winter months, leave a whole lot of time for photography. But um, so that is a very, very real con uh, constraint for sure. There is no color out there. Everything is brown and gray. Well, to some degree, chlorophyll is kind of hard to find this time of year, but there is color. Um, a lot of this is about sensitizing your, your awareness to the environment around you. And I think the more time you spend Certainly with me, the more time I spend looking around at what's around me in nature, um, I'm amazed at, at how much color there actually is out there. So um, that's, that's kind of a, a, a phony excuse in my, in my view. I used to hold it myself, but actually it, there's plenty of, plenty of things out there to see and do. So uh, the first thing though, as I'm sure everybody would agree, if you're not comfortable, no matter what you're doing, if you're cold, if you're miserable, are you going to be enjoying the activity that you're engaged, engaged in, whether it's photography or anything else? Obviously, you won't be. Um, so get warm and dress in layers. I mean, we all have heard this for years, dress in layers. And so if you wanna be comfortable in the winter, get used to dressing like this person here. How many of you dress like that? Raise your hand when you're outside. I see a few hands going up, good. Um, beyond that, there were some very specific dimensions of uh, dressing that are very, very helpful if you're a photographer. So, and there is, by the way, a bit of a delay I'm seeing with these slides, so hang in there. When I click my mouse, there is a little bit of a delay for the slides to come up. Um, what you're looking at is me holding one of my cameras in the woods down the street about a week ago. We needed to come up with a photo to illustrate the point. Um, if your fingers are frozen and numb and in pain, again, you're not gonna be enjoying photography at all. And so you're much less likely to be outside. This is a very good way of keeping your fingers warm. These uh, mittens that uh, retract to expose your fingertips are really great. Um, if they're all, you know, old rag wool mittens. Now, if you like to spend money, there's always somebody that's willing to take your hard-earned money. You can get into one of the uh, photography suppliers who is more than happy to sell you the $75 pair of special photography gloves. Now, if you compare those gloves with my rag wool mittens, they functionally do the same thing. They have retractable fingertips that allow you to uh, operate the camera controls and put them back in place when you wanna warm your finger. Here's something I really, really wanna recommend. Um, oh, about five, six years ago, I was scrambling on the rocks before sunrise, middle of the winter, uh, below Portland head light, and I was by myself. Um, anybody that's ever uh, scrambled along rocks below, uh, rocks that are usually covered at high tide knows that there's something called black algae covering the rocks, and there isn't anything more slick on the planet than that. Long story short, I took a tumble and went ass over tea kettle. I was all alone. When I hit the ground, I didn't get up for about 20 minutes. It was so painful and ended up busting my knee. Had I had these things on my feet, I'm convinced um, I wouldn't have had to go through all that pain and misery with that fall. Luckily, the camera was okay, though, so that matters too. But take a look at these little slip-on um, yak tracks. And there are other companies that make a similar thing. They're very useful. You know, hand warmers, um, and toe warmers. I've never actually used these things. I have some in a drawer down the hall. I've had them for years, but I run into lots and lots of people that use them and they swear by them. So again, it's another way of keeping yourself comfortable during the cold weather. Needless to say, if you're outdoors and it's cold, your furnace is burning lots of calories just trying to keep you warm. So bring snacks and drink water. And then finally, 
this little item didn't really fit naturally into any of my slides, so I stuck it here. But I must have three or four headlamps in my car. And I will tell you, with photography, if you do any sort of photography in reduced light or even pitch black, of course, having a head, headlamp is going to be a very, very useful thing to have. If you're going to be using it after dark specifically, it's good to get one that has a red lens on it because your eyes become a little bit more sensitized that way. So headlamps are great and they really don't cost that much. So let's focus a little bit on image quality here. Um, most photographers that I know, generally speaking, are shooting to create the most sharp images that they can render. And uh, I'm guessing that all of you are of a similar faith, if you will. And the way to get sharp images, frankly, is to get the camera out of your hand. I've been saying this for years. If you really want to maximize sharp images, get the camera out of your hands because simply by holding that camera, you're introducing something called camera shake. I don't care if you haven't had a black cup of coffee for six months and you think you're the most cool dude on the planet, um, you're still introducing some motion if you handhold a camera. And by the way, that applies to a cell phone too. So if you can just focus on getting the camera out of your hand, that brings you, a, that's a quantum leap forward in terms of achieving sharp images. Now here with this slide, I've got a couple of different things I'm, I'm uh, showing you. Number one is, um, I've got somebody here, I've got a let in, pardon me. Um, if you look on the left, that's just a traditional tripod. And uh, how many of you have tripods? Well, I actually can't see you. I hope you do. Tripods are not that expensive. But if you want to maintain the sharpest images possible, put it on a tripod, get it out of your hands. That would apply to a cell phone. There are other ways of stabilizing a camera and lens by removing it from your hands. That photo in the center is simply nothing more than a, sand, a bean bag or a sandbag. And you can either make your own by stuffing a sock with dry beans or rice, or you can spend money, which again, the vendor is happy to take from you. But these are wonderful stabilization devices. You can slap the beanbag down on a rock, for example, put the camera body on the beanbag, and you have a very stable, immovable uh, camera. And then this fella on the right, who's got a camera on what looks like a, a long pole, it's called a monopod, and it's essentially a tripod minus two legs. And they, again, can be very, very helpful. So just a couple of things you can do to maximize your, your image quality. Let's move to the next slide. Keeping your fingers from going numb. So we talked about the gloves. Now, if you are going to be a user of tripods, um, this becomes a pretty important thing this time of year. Tripods tend to be, or the legs, tripod legs tend, tend to be made out of one of two things, carbon fiber or some type of aluminum or magnesium alloy, metal. Uh, the metal tripod legs in the cold can freeze your fingers off. And so if you have the money, a carbon fiber tripod is the way to go solely for the, the, the advantage it gives you from the standpoint of not conducting the cold as, as, as much as a metal tripod will. But I'm a cheap Yankee. I happen to have a carbon fiber tripod, but mostly what I have are the aluminum or magnesium aluminum tripods, and they will freeze your fingers off at 10 degrees. So what can you do? To improve that situation. Well, this little photo that just came in on the lower left part of the slide, you'll see some fancy camouflage, um, essentially insulation sleeves that you can purchase and wrap around the, the uh, feet or the legs on your tripod, and they work great. However, again, if you're a cheap Yankee like I am, it's far more desirable to go to Home Depot, buy a a three or four dollar package of foam pipe insulation, cut it to size, wrap it around your tripod legs and, and keep it in place with some electrical tape and you'll be good to go. But a huge advantage, if you've ever used a, a magnesium or aluminum tripod in the winter, you'll know how miserable it can make your outing. Another, another little thing about sharp images and camera settings. So I've already talked about getting the camera out of your hand. So you can avoid or entirely avoid um, what's called camera shake. 
that can be very helpful. But there's something else you can do to achieve the sharpest images. And you can do that in your camera's settings. And so what do you do? Well, your goal is to get the fastest shutter speed you possibly can. If you think about how a camera operates, it's very simple. You push a button, it's a light tight box. You push a button, a little trap door flaps open. It collects light for a certain period of time. The trap door shuts and there's your image. So it makes sense, I hope, that if you can minimize the amount of time that that shutter is open, make it a split second versus a second, for example, you're gonna have much less opportunity by virtue of the passage of time for that camera shake or camera blur to enter your image. So how do you do that? How do you achieve a fast shutter speed? Well, pretty simple, number of ways you can do it. Simply put your camera, if you have the setting, on what's called shutter priority. Most cameras will have a range of settings from automatic to manual, aperture priority, shutter priority, et cetera. Shutter priority is where you can actually tell the camera how fast or not to keep that shutter open. The quicker it opens and closes, the better you're gonna have a sharp image. So that's number one. Another thing is to simply have as wide opening when that shutter opens, if you have a big circle, it's called the aperture, a wide aperture. Again, that's gonna mean that the shutter is gonna open and close very fast and you'll be able to minimize um, any shake that's gonna be introduced into that image and also freeze whatever motion. If you're photographing an animal that's moving or a piece of grass or something that's waving in the breeze, the faster that shutter opens and closes, the more you're gonna be able to freeze motion and minimize blur. And the final bullet here may be somewhat alien to some of you, and that's okay. It's called ISO or ISO. All ISO means is it's, a, it's an indication of how sensitive your digital camera's image sensor is to light. That may even seem a little confusing. Remember it this way, the higher you set the ISO, the more likely you are to have a sharp image, okay? The higher the ISO, the faster the shutter is gonna open and close. There's a whole lecture I could give around ISO, but I won't. But I just wanted to sort of bring those little uh, items to the fore so you understand that there are things that you can set on your camera that will maximize um, how sharp your images are. And then finally, the good news is compared to say to even 10 years ago, most cameras, um, I would say a lot of cameras that you buy today have built in right into the camera body, something called image stabilization. If they don't have image stabilization built into the camera body, and that is the case, by the way, with Nikon and Canon DSLRs, you buy lenses for those camera, camera bodies that have image stabilization built into the lenses. Image stabilization is simply an electronic mechanical device built into either the lens or the camera body, and it basically counteracts camera shake. So again, the idea is to get you sharp images. So hopefully that makes sense. If you're buying a new camera or if you're buying lenses, that's critical to know whether or not the camera body or the camera lenses have image stabilization. So just kind of keep an eye on Back to the lousy weather. Um, cameras and electronics in general don't mix really well with moisture. Probably all of you know that already. So as you can imagine, there are all sorts of doohickeys and gadgets that you can buy. Again, you can spend a lot of money on this hobby if you really want to, or get by on the cheap like a lot of us do. But you can actually buy raincoats for cameras. And if you look on the upper right side of the slide, that's what you see there. Um, they come in all makes and, and price points. And wow, you can really outfit that camera and have it looking pretty nifty and stylish. Or you can use a gallon sized Ziploc bag or on the lower left photo on this slide has a disposable rain cover. Now I bought two of these, again, they're disposable. I bought two of these about 20 years ago and guess what? They're still sitting in my camera bag. I've never used them. So what does that tell you? I don't tend to take my camera gear out in the rain. So that's another thing to keep in mind. 
One thing that's hugely important to know about cold weather, batteries and cold weather don't mix. Batteries and cold temperatures don't mix. So it's a good idea when you go out in cold weather to take at least two camera batteries with you. Um, keep Obviously, there'll be one in the camera. And by the way, make sure they're charged uh, before you go out the door. I'm sure you, like me, have made the mistake where you grab a couple of camera batteries and when you stick it in the camera body, the little indicator says it's either dead or almost. That doesn't help anybody. But if you look in the lower right photo, um, it's as simple as what I'm showing you there. Stick a battery inside your breast pocket so your body can keep it warm. And at some point, if you're out long enough with your camera in cold weather, that camera battery will likely crap out. And so at that point, you won't be dead in the water if you have this spare warm battery that you can take out of your pocket and swap into the camera. So that's a really good thing to keep in mind. Now, as I said, moisture does not mix with electronics. It certainly doesn't mix with optics, especially expensive optics or lenses as well. The thing you wanna be very careful about this time of year, the air outside, if it's cold, is very, very dry. If you walk in from, let's say, a 20 degree outdoor temperature into a home that's like 70 degrees, where the humidity is higher, much higher than it was outside, what do you think is gonna to happen to your camera gear? The glass, the body, the lens. It's gonna do exactly what you see here in this picture. Condensation, the moisture in that warm air is gonna settle on cold surfaces. And this can be an absolute disaster if that moisture somehow makes it inside the lens. Keep in mind that most lenses these days are essentially a cylinder with a whole bunch, a series, of little uh, glass elements. And there are many ways for moisture and humidity to get inside of this container. And you really want to minimize that. So the easiest thing to do is if you're coming inside from the cold and your camera is in a camera bag, keep it in the camera bag. Bring it inside if you have to, but put it on the floor and just let that temperature inside the camera bag equilibrate with the room temperature much more gradually than will be the case if you flip the lid open on the bag, pull the camera out, and you can have this kind of disaster in the, in the waiting happen. So that's a huge tip, huge tip. So be very, very careful with that. Now let's talk a little bit about wildlife photography and camera equipment and prices and how cost prohibitive certain dimensions of this hobby can be. So if you come down to Parker River National Wildlife Refuge this time, of, this time of year, you're not gonna see that animal that you see in the picture, but you are gonna see a lot of lenses like the lens this fella has on his camera. That's what I call a big gun or a, or a bird lens. And they're great, they're wonderful. If you wanna produce the most exceptional, a professional quality uh, zoomed in picture of a bird, uh, that you're capable of with your camera body, you want one of these $15,000 lenses. However, if you're like me, who doesn't really have that kind of spare cash sitting around, um, you're going to hope for something else or you're going to find different types of pictures to take. The good news, starting about six or seven years ago, a couple of the third-party camera lens manufacturers, specifically Tamron and Sigma, started making these, they call them prosumer grade ultra zoom lenses. So let me back up and tell you what that means. The lens that this gentleman uh, with that animal, I think, is that a meerkat, I think? But anyway, that big lens on the left, that's probably either a 500 or a 600 millimeter lens. That's a big gun telephoto lens. That's quite a reach, 500 or 600 millimeters. Um, that's a price point most of us can't touch. However, with these new ultra zoom lenses that came out five or six years ago, that price dropped from $15,000 down to as low right now as about $900. Um, the zoom that that young lady is using is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 millimeters 
to five or 600 on the long end. That gets you the same uh, zoom or reach as that $15,000 lens on the left. Are they as good optically as the $15,000 lens? No, they are not, but they're pretty darn good. And it suddenly gives you this great capacity to pull in those pictures of birds that may be 100 yards or so out in the marsh, which you couldn't even think about taking pictures of prior to the advent of these new ultra zoom lenses. It always reminds me of this quote you've heard, and I thought Hitzel Adams said it, and maybe he did, but it was attributed to somebody else who, uh, whose name I've already forgotten, but the best camera to use is the one you have. I mean, that's, that's the point. And that applies to the smartphone as well. And we'll talk about smartphones in a little while. So the point is there are lenses that will get you out that reach, will get you, will put you out where that animal is, out in the salt marsh, for example, at Parker River, that doesn't require that you mortgage your future. Now, one thing that I've always said, and many photographers say, if you have an interest in dabbling or entering into the world of taking pictures of wildlife, and this has always been the case, um, if you can get yourself up to the 300 millimeter uh, point uh, focal length, you can begin to pull animals in that are a little farther away. So this is still the case. If you don't have a long lens, collective these, these, collectively these are called long lenses, a 70 to 300 millimeter zoom is a pretty good entry point it's not going to break the bank. Now, this happens to be a Nikon brand, which tend to be a little bit more expensive than the third-party lenses. But this one, I checked the other day, is about $400. Um, if you go with a Tamron or a Sigma or some other brand, you can get it cheaper. And of course, you can always buy a second hand as well. But the point here, the point that I really want to leave you with is you can become a wildlife photographer. You can pull animals in at some distance if you can get yourself up to a 300 millimeter equivalent focal length. The other thing that's changed big time in the last couple of years, there are now what I call hypersteroidal all-in-one super zooms. Um, basically, you get a huge zoom range from wide angle out to a pretty decent uh, reach. In this case, the lens I'm showing you here is one that I carry around. It's a Tamron 18 to 400 millimeter lens. These, again, are not professional caliber lenses. They're not. This one's about 650 bucks, which again, is still a fair amount of money. But the beauty of having something with this uh, zoom range, wide angle to pretty decent reach, um, is you, uh, you really don't have to swap out lenses very much. You can kind of keep this on your camera and it will work for you in a whole host of situations. So just keep that in mind. And again, all of the camera lens manufacturers have the, the equivalent type of hypersteroidal all-in-one super zoom. Boy, that's a mouthful. Um, I've been very happy with the Tamron, as, as has my wife. So that's not a bad lens to play with if you want to put yourself in that kind of a lens. Having said all of that, if you still don't have the inclination, the interest, the money, or whatever, to get yourself some reach a lens that puts you out there where that animal is to some degree, you can still take compelling images of wildlife. And so here's an example. Um, this is a snowy owl, as I'm sure you know, and they tend to be the popular in other environments during the winter down, down here. This is one that was out at Hellcat a few weeks ago, sitting on a post, minding its own business, where a whole bunch of owl paparazzi taking its snapshot. Um, but it, this lens that I shot this with was a very short focal length, and yet I managed to get a pretty decent environmental portrait. So that's my point. If you are unable mechanically or optically to fill the frame because you lack having that super zoom reach, you can still take a decent, if not compelling, picture of that wild animal by simply uh, taking an environmental portrait, a contextual portrait. And in some regards, I find those more interesting because rather than just a bird or some other animal filling the frame, which can be great, this kind of picture tells me about 
the environment this animal is in. If it's doing something, if it's behaving in some manner, it tells me something about its behavior. So again, if you just have an 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens, which is typically what comes with a uh, entry level DSLR or digital camera, you can still take great wildlife photos. The other thing, a very similar picture on the right, a little less zoomed in, simply by adding human beings or some other what we call foreground element, you create a very different type of photo than the one you see on the left. I like the one on the right. These two people, uh, first, one thing, it, it just tells you that there are people out there photographing these, these amazing animals. But by having something in the foreground, and I'll say this a little bit later as well, it adds a sense of depth to the photograph. It's more three-dimensional than is the one on the right. So just consider putting foreground elements into some of your images. There is one piece of equipment, probably almost more than any other piece of equipment, with the exception of the camera and lens itself, that I absolutely recommend. This is called a circular polarizer. Um, this is a little piece of glass, and they come in a whole range of prices, anywhere from 20 bucks on up to four or 500, depending on what you buy. They fit the diameter of the end of your lens barrel. Typically, you want to buy the widest diameter circular polarizer you can that fits your widest lens. And then you can actually use little metal rings to step that same polarizer down for narrower diameter um, uh, lens sizes. But what does it do? The circular polarizer is amazing. It's actually two pieces of glass sandwiched together in this little metal frame and you attach it to the end of your camera lens and you rotate the ring. And it does a number of things, particularly if you're at about 90 degrees to the sun. Okay, if you're about 90 degrees to the sun, a circular polarizer has its, its maximum effect. What does it do? Well, if you look at the picture on the right, it does a number of things. There's the before and after. On the left, no polarization. On the right, polarization. So it reflect, reduces reflections on water and glass, reduces haze and glare, intensifies colors. However, it also slows down your shutter speed because it's letting less light into the camera. You can see it's a dark piece of glass. And at a supremely wide angle, if you're using a zoom lens, if you zoom in all the way and you, you've got a really wide angle, you may see across the sky uneven polarization. That's one of the drawbacks of using a circular polarizer at an extreme wide angle. You can get this banding effect in the sky. Um, but they're great, and they do all sorts of wonderful things. You see the list right there. And so for anybody that takes images outdoors, I fully uh, recommend that you look into getting a circular polarizer. Again, you can start with a $20 or $25 one and move your way up at some point if you want to, but they are that magical. Um, one of the things they tend to do, by the way, and you can see it in that photo on the left, is they make white clouds pop in a blue sky. Again, remember that a circular polarizer is maximally effective when you are 90 degrees to the direction of the sun. If you're shooting into the sun or the sun is directly behind you, it has almost no effect. So that's another thing to keep in mind. The other thing that I want to mention about winter photography, if you're out there shooting snow and you haven't made a critical adjustment to your camera, the snow is going to come out looking almost always, particularly if it dominates the scene, looking like the snow on the left in this picture. It's going to look gray. Your camera has an exposure meter. And your exposure meter in that camera's simple little brain is always to make whatever is in the scene the equivalent of 18% gray. It's going to take anything that looks white and it's going to want to make it gray. Just realize that that's going to happen. It's not you. It's that silly little brain in your camera. So how do you counteract that? Well, you use something called exposure compensation. Most cameras, if they have manual controls at all, will have a little dial that will allow you to add light or subtract light. Um, so I know for a fact, because I've been doing this long enough, if I'm going to be shooting a snowfield like here, 
I have got to add one or two stops of light. That's the unit of measure, stops of light. Here it's plus two, and you can see the difference between the gray snow on the right, on the left, and the properly exposed snow field on the right. It took adding two stops of light. Typically, what we suggest is you add one to two stops. It's really gonna depend on the specific situation, but in most cases, certainly with snow and with the white sandy beach, anything that's really bright, you're gonna to wanna to add light because the camera's gonna to wanna to make it gray. Same thing if you're shooting a buffalo on a snowfield. So as you can see here on the left, that's the way the camera was gonna do it without your intervention. On the right, by adding a stop or two of light, it's much more properly exposed. So hopefully that makes sense. Dig into your manual, figure out where the exposure compensation setting is on your camera. It may be a dial, it may be a menu item, but it's worth knowing about. One of the wonderful things about photographing during the winter is that the, la, the, the sun is really much lower in the sky this time of year than it is the rest of the year. And so you get a lot of really warm, pleasing light. Um, but again, as with photography, any time of the year outside, um, you're gonna get the, the nicest looking light, typically early in the day and later in the day. And the, and the really convenient factor there is that many species of wildlife tend to be active early in the day and late in the day. So not only are you gonna find animals, hopefully, more likely early and late in the day, but you're gonna have much more pleasing lighting situations. So keep that in mind as well. So let's talk a little bit about photographing wildlife specifically or animals. So the first thing, and I alluded to this earlier, I'd been walking around thinking, well, oh, winter photography, there's really not much around. But when I started looking at some of the images that I've collected just around Parker River over the last seven, eight, nine years, it became pretty clear to me pretty quickly um, that boy, there actually are quite a few wild animals that if you're out at the right time, and some of it's luck too, by the way, when run, running into these things, um, there's quite a bit of wildlife this time of year. And I'm showing you just some of the images that I pulled out of my hard drives. And all of these critters can be found in the winter in and around the Newburyport area, for sure. Ducks and geese. Snowy owls, there's a lot more than just that. And even within the ducks and geese category, as you can see here with these northern pintails, I'd never photographed before until a couple of weeks ago. My God, they're gorgeous. And they look a lot different, obviously, than the typical Canada goose or mallard or wood duck. I mean, they're all gorgeous. But again, there's an amazing diversity of wildlife around, even in the winter, if you're just alert for it. A lot of shorebirds on the beach this time of year. Even the Canada goose, that many people lament for what they do to their lawns. Um, they're absolutely beautiful birds. Seagulls, I think, are absolutely beautiful birds. And so whether it's a frame-filling individual or this flock that just happens to be seen flying over the marsh in some nice light, my Lord, they're beautiful. So there's lots of things to photograph. Of course, we talk a little bit about the snowy owl. And it's been a relatively good winter for the snowy owl. Hopefully some of you have had a chance to get out and see them. Um, they're not always there. People are always asking us, where are the snowies? And you know, you generally don't know. It's not gonna just be sitting out there for weeks on end waiting for people to show up with cameras and binoculars, but it's been a pretty good year. And they're gorgeous. And there's a reason we call these charismatic megafauna. And if you're lucky, you may have an opportunity to have a special encounter with one. The one thing I would certainly ask, we make this plea all the time, please keep your distance. These animals, all wildlife, particularly during the winter months, are burning lots of calories. And the more we people make them nervous and stressed, the more calories they burn up and the more they can be perhaps placed in jeopardy just by virtue of our enthusiasm. There are things with fur that are around in the winter. Um, beyond the squirrel below your bird feeder, there are coyotes, 
This is the only coyote I've ever photographed on a Parker River. Ran into it. It's not a very good picture, um, but they're what a gorgeous animal. Um, red foxes. I mean, there's all sorts of mammals. If you just keep an eye out, you'll see them if you're lucky. Here's a marine mammal, which is really, really easy to photograph and a whole lot of fun. These are harbor seals. And if you want to photograph harbor seals, find out when dead low tide is going to be in the mouth of the Merrimack River and find your way over to Salisbury State Reservation. Again, if you have a minimum of a 300 millimeter lens, it's that cheap zoom I was talking about a few minutes ago, you can take pictures of harbor seals hauled out on the ledges at dead low tide in the mouth of the Merrimack River and many other places as well. The other thing I always recommend, why not practice? Every, whether it's photography or anything else, you get better with practice. Photographing things that move, animals, can take some skill. You develop skill by practicing. So why not focus on something very common that you can find pretty much anywhere? And the gull or the seagull is sort of my poster child for the bird that you can really spend a lot of time with very easily practicing your skills. Also, my charge here with this slide is to take something that's very common or in many cases, even derided and create a compelling image out of it, which I think in both cases, at least for me, if I can toot my horn a little bit, I love these images. And it, they feature seagulls. So I created a couple of nice looking images using seagulls. You can do the same thing. Then there's something I simply call missed shots. I can't tell you how many pictures I've seen on Facebook, how many pictures I've taken, and I'm not a bird photographer, of snowy owls sitting on a stump or on a dune, whiling away the days of daylight, the hours of daylight, with their eyes closed. It's a pretty easy shot to get. Again, please don't get near them. Give them wide berth. But once you've seen these pictures, you've kind of seen them all. So this animal, who I happened to be coming up on, didn't know it was there, saw me, took up, and left. And I grabbed my camera reflexively and grabbed this shot. Didn't even get its entire body in the frame. But the more I look at this image, the more I'm growing attached to it, because it really does tell me quite a a lot more about a snowy owl than a snowy owl sort of sitting on a stump sleeping. Look at the fur, and not the fur, look at the fine feathers covering those talons. Look at the, the sheer enormity of this bird. They have a five foot wingspan typically. Look at the power. Um, to me, this behavior shot, this behavior portrait is much more compelling than a snowy owl sitting on a stump. Well, I've got plenty of those too. Here's another thing I want to encourage everybody to do. Um, I call it turning, there's, there's an old adage. It's a little blue, so I'm not going to fill in the blank, but turning chicken blank into chicken salad. So here's an image I grabbed out my car window at one of the refuges not too long ago. And it was very dark, very overcast. Camera settings weren't very good. And the image turned out very underexposed. So rather than throwing it out and keeping in mind that I had a program coming up, this one, I thought I would try and illustrate a point that even if it's kind of a crappy image, if you like playing with the image on a computer, you may actually turn it into something that's closer to chicken salad than that other chicken uh, concoction I talked about. So just keep that in mind. Um, ethical, ethical field practices of wildlife photography. And we, we always center our attention on the snowy owl this time of year because it brings out people in great numbers. And whereas most folks are pretty respectful and follow the rules, some of them don't. And so that's why uh, we, we promote heavily ethical field practices in wildlife photography. There's actually an organization called the North American Nature Photography Association. I think Mass Audubon has something somewhat similar. It basically just puts forth some really common sense principles that are designed to keep wildlife wild.
keep them safe. And in the process, encourages hopefully pretty much everybody to follow the rules so that everybody has an opportunity to enjoy these creatures out in the wild. But you know, there are those that will transgress and will break the rules and will get closer to a snowy owl than they should. And so I'm not gonna say anything more about it than that. Okay, if you don't happen to see animals, and I gotta get moving here, because I, as always, I talk a lot. Um, I wanna get through the slideshow. By the way, nod your heads, those that I can see, if, if this is at all interesting, shake your head no if it's lousy. Okay, so far so good. I need to, I need to move on here though. So let's assume there are no animals around when you get to your destination and you wanted to photograph animals. Are you up the creek without a paddle? The answer is no. If you take this approach, look for the evidence of their presence. Wild animals can be detected on the landscape without even being there when you are. So a lot of this is pretty common sense, but I'll point it out anyway. Whether it's um, looks like mouse tracks on a sand dune, or wild turkey tracks in the snow on the right there, certainly tell tale of something that was there before you got there. Um, how about where they live? This is a muskrat lodge on, an, on a little pond on Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. When the leaves drop in the fall, all of a sudden, as I'm driving up and down the refuge road, I'm blown out of the water by the realization of the sheer magnitude of birds that build nests on that refuge. They're everywhere. So again, telltale sign that there is wildlife in the area. Beaver, you go to a beaver wetland and they're all over the place. There's all sorts of animal sign or beaver sign. Chewed trees, beaver lodges, beaver dams, beaver haulouts, you name it. They're really fun to go and find. Not just the beaver, but these signs of the beaver. Another thing that's very telltale, um, cavity trees, um, often called snags, these big dead trees that are just lifeless and full of holes, they provide amazing um, habitat or habitat to an amazing variety of, of animals. So again, everything that I've shown you in these two slides is evidence of wildlife that was there, may still be there. However, let's assume there's no wildlife whatsoever. Are there other things that you can photograph that at least give you an opportunity to approximate what it's like to photograph an animal? And of course there is. And so for example, a place that I've stopped at periodically for years because it's right next to our visitor center is the Pierce Little Farm owned by Historic New England where they have a small tribe of uh, MSPCA animals that are on display and they're very, very popular with the local public. Some of you I'm sure have been over there, but again, it's a great place to practice your wildlife or animal photography skills. And of course, these guys will come right up to you. So they're pretty easy targets. Remember that one of the goals with wildlife photography, you'll hear it again, is to get the eyes sharp. You'll wanna make the eyes sharp, like that little eyeball in the lower right. And then, of course, if, if nothing else, you can focus on your pets. Point your camera in the direction of your pets and have at it. You can create some pretty compelling images. This, by the way, is Mr. Felix. He's our pet, the lower, the, the black cat. So, and he posed for me just the other day. It's a lot of fun. You guys, I'm sure, do the same thing. Indoor opportunities, other places where you can go photograph wildlife. There is a phenomenal a butterfly house in South Deerfield, Massachusetts called Magic Wings. We checked the web today and they're actually open. Um, great place to go, might not go next week because it's school vacation, but it's a great place to practice your wildlife photography skills. Um, other places, for years, I've been notorious here in my family for running into PetSmart or Petco with my smartphone and somewhat surreptitiously sneaking around taking lizard pictures through aquarium windows. And that's what, where this little guy came from. Just playing with my smartphone, it's nothing more than that. Playing with, taking a picture with a smartphone, editing that picture and then putting it up on social media. Finally, another place to go and take pictures of animals is your backyard. I'm sure that many of you have bird feeding stations in your backyard. The stuff has been flying off the shelf at Walmart all winter long. So we know it's popular. 
And again, it's a very controlled environment where you're pretty much guaranteed success. So I'll just show you a few images that were taken here at the house in South Berwick. And by the way, notice that not all of them are sitting on a bird feeder or clinging to a suet cage. Not very wild looking, although it's a place to start. If you can get them in the trees near the bird feeder, you get a much more realistic looking wildlife portrait. But our bird feeding station here is nothing fancy. I've been showing versions of this in slideshows for years. It's a four by four post that at different times of the year has different types of things hanging off it. But that's pretty much where all the bird photography occurs here um, and the trees nearby. There's nothing prettier than something like this in my view, and it's totally contrived. That log right now is bolted to the top of our four by four posts, but you'd never know it unless I told you, right? Again, um, an amazing diversity of wild creatures right in your backyard. And it's a lot of fun and very easy photography to do. Bluebirds have just started coming back here year round, just last three or four years. And as long as you provide them with an endless supply of these uh, somewhat overpriced mealworms, they're, they're gonna show up in large numbers in some cases. Not everybody will get them, but we get them quite a bit here now. If you have any interest in learning how to set up natural looking conditions around a bird feeder, there is a wonderful resource by this fellow named Alan Murphy. Alan Murphy has put together this amazing guide. It's an ebook that shows you all sorts of setups that you can contrive in your backyard for very little price and create amazing images. Again, it's phony, but you can create some great images. And if you like that sort of thing, which I do, go for it. Um, this is a book I pulled off my bookshelf. And it's a great book. It's very similar to that ebook I just referred to, but it's full of little recipes, little ideas for how you can set up your backyard with for bird, bird photography. So again, look into that if you have an interest. Finally, I want to recap before we get to landscapes, very quickly, some wildlife photography tips, many of which I've already talked about. One, make sure the eyes are sharp. If you see a picture or a photograph of, an, of a wild animal or even a domestic animal and the eyes are not tack sharp, it's not gonna be a good image. You will not find it appealing. Try and shoot at the animal's level. Get down at its eye level if you possibly can. Again, much more realistic and compelling image making. If you lack that zoom potential, or if you just simply wanna educate somebody about that animal's habits and habitat, shoot environmental and behavior shots, not just that frame filling portrait. Keep in mind, remember that many critters are more active early and late in the day. If you wanna freeze movement and mi minimize camera or image blur, get a fast shutter speed, however you do it, and put that camera on a tripod. If you use your, your car as a photo blind versus pulling your car over when you see something, getting out of that car, uh, and then pointing your camera at the animal. You're gonna have a lot more success if you stay in the car. Most wildlife are habituated to moving motor vehicles, much less habituated to people. Um, so keep that in mind. Learn the habits and habitats of the animal and you'll have a lot greater success finding them. And then finally, when you are filling that frame with a, with a portrait of whatever, a lizard at Petco or a snow owl somewhere along the New England coast, be careful with distracting backgrounds. You can have a perfectly exposed, sharp image of an owl, but if there's a telephone pole growing out of its head because there's a pole right behind it, you will have a lousy image. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Now let's talk briefly about photographing everything else. Boy, that sounds like an easy lift, doesn't it? Photographing everything else. Non-wildlife, that's why I call this nature and wildlife. So number one, water is probably the most obvious, the many faces of water, and I'll just rattle through these, but we live along the coast here. So of course, you're gonna go out and photograph the ocean, but how you photograph it, when you photograph it, how you photograph it can mean the, dif the difference between a ho-hum image and a really great image. You can freeze the action, as I did in this case, 
or you can sort of get, get it somewhere half between frozen and flowing, which is kind of what this is. Look at the energy in this image along the Plum Island beach sometime not too long ago when the wind was howling and we, we were just in the wake of a nor'easter. The other thing I like to do with coastal water is I want to occasionally take long exposure images where I am really slowing down the shutter speed. I'm keeping that shutter open a very long time so you get this implied motion effect, sort of this silky look. And you do that, by the way, in a number of ways, but essentially you put something called a neutral density filter, which is nothing more than a piece of very dark glass on the end of your lens, which forces the shutters to stay open for an extended period of time and you get this sort of photography. This is a whole other lecture I could do, but suffice it to say, this is called long exposure photography. I really like it. A little goes a long way, but it's kind of fun to do. Same thing here. Again, I used a very long shutter speed. I like this kind of thing. It's not for everybody. It's a certain technique to get there. And sometimes putting a little foreground interest, like I mentioned earlier, um, in this case, it happens to be a shadow caused by yours truly with a tripod on the Plum Island beach. It just adds a layer of interest. It adds a sense of depth. And I think it makes it a better picture. Frozen water, ice, cascading stream. Um, it's a very good thing to sort of seek out this time of year because you're not going to do this in June. Let's hope not, at least. Very, very distinct and pleasing type of image. Um, River, cascading river or stream shots, same thing. Long exposure times. Shutter was open a long time, really cool. I like doing a lot of this. You notice the snow in the foreground. This actually was winter. This is the Wildcat River up in uh, New Hampshire. This is a little cascading stream right down the street here in South Berwick. So again, doesn't matter where you are, you can find these water elements pretty much everywhere. And if you know the technique, you can create some compelling images. Let's talk about ice. This is a, a Salisbury State Park um, last winter. You can see the, the little needle thing out there in the distance. I forget what they call that. The toothpick. Um, it kind of reminds me of some of those Icelandic beach shots where the ice in that case is usually blue. Just ice, ice in general, just frozen ice formations really creates very, very interesting and compelling images. Um, this was on Long Sands Beach in New York couple of years ago, really cold, which is why you have the sea smoke there in the background. It has to be super, super cold to have sea smoke. Um, little detail shots of frozen patterns of ice on the ground, really cool, I like that. If you're really lucky and have single pane windows, you can get some really neat ice crystal patterns on super cold mornings when there had been a lot of humidity in the air the night before. I'm sure some of you have done this. I love this little picture of a uh, sheared nail in an old deck that had these little frost uh, patterns on it, shot with a cell phone. Uh, I mentioned sea smoke a couple of minutes ago. It has to be super, super cold. I would say 10 degrees Fahrenheit and below, rush off to the ocean in the morning, and sometimes you can get this sort of situation, and it's just amazing. Love this stuff. If you haven't, uh, dress for it. It can be pretty miserable experience. That's where those fancy gloves we talked about earlier come into play. Fog can be a very interesting time or situation or lighting condition to take pictures in. This is just the Newburyport waterfront not too long ago. Um, trees. Trees are, I love shooting trees and landscapes. And there's always, you know, multiple different ways of doing it. The same tree here in the background shot two different ways. Look at vertical versus horizontal compositions. That's another thing. If you're shooting a scene, consider looking at your camera's viewfinder through both um, portrait and landscape orientation. Look to the sky this time of year. You can find a lot of color there. And obviously, um, cloud formations are endlessly fascinating and diverse. This was a panorama shot with a smartphone at Sandy Point State Park a couple of years ago. Again, endless opportunities. To looking at the sky. People love to shoot the moon. If you have a 300 millimeter, a 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens, I would say you really need to have 300 millimeters or above 
you can get a good shot of the moon. Look up the recipe, if you will, on Google, because there's lots of different approaches. Typically what I do is put the camera on spot metering, so I'm only metering on the moon, not the dark sky, and play with your exposure compensation settings. And absolutely have your camera on a tripod. But again, just a lot of the moon shots look the same, but if you do them under different conditions, they can really look quite different and quite beautiful, I think. So here's a few that I've taken over the last couple of years. Moon photography. Sunrise and sunset is a bazillion of these. You've all done it, I'm sure. The conditions are always different. Um, and I always play with the exposure settings when I'm taking pictures and then look at the LCD on the back of the camera to make sure you're capturing something that you like. Consider using some type of silhouetting situation like I did with one of these world famous boardwalks at Parker River. It adds a dimension, it adds depth, it makes the interest of the composition more interesting looking. But again, every sunrise and sunset condition is different. You just need to get out and experience them. This is called a high dynamic range sunrise that I did a number of years ago at Parker River, meaning that I was out there on the beach, actually was leading a workshop that day with some folks from our photo club and had the camera on a tripod and was shooting many different exposures, different light levels of the same sunrise at the same point. And then I merged all of those in a software program on the computer and that produced what's called a high dynamic range image. That's a whole different technique you can look up if you're curious about it. High dynamic range imaging, a lot of fun. And again, unique sunrises and sunsets are as varied as there are days of the year. The other thing I encourage people to play with is black and white. Uh, particularly during the winter, it can be a very, very effective way of capturing nature. And I love this bony tree that I've been tracking for 10 years in the dunes of Parker River. I love it. And this is one of my favorite renderings of that bony tree with that stark looking uh, sky behind it. Um, and then simple abstracts like this, black and white. Again, York Harbor Beach. There's a lot going on here, but for me anyway, the elements come together, uh, combine to really provide a pretty interesting image. So it's, it's kind of a still life, kind of an abstract, and there isn't a duck or a seagull anywhere to be seen. You can even see the clouds being reflected in the water there. Very cool. Talk briefly about what I call microscapes, which is kind of everything else. Patterns and textures in nature. Um, the way the, the frost, the frosty snow clung to the grass in the dunes here, um, I thought was very interesting. I love this kind of stuff. Um, just little snapshots like this of, 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 in this case, dune vegetation poking up through a blanket of snow creates a very interesting kind of still life. I like this a lot. Um, dendritic pattern. Dendritic means branching or tree-like. Um, in, in, the, um, in the sand. You've all seen these along the beach. Something you can do year round, really interesting. Um, lichens, the colors and textures in bark, I just find fascinating. Um, so you can shoot this any time of the year. So as you can see, there's a lot of color in the winter. Um, this is pine bark, beautiful, gorgeous. Gets me excited, really neat, easy to do. That's a smartphone image. Um, a light covering of snow over a branch that's got um, some really neat mushroom-like growths coming off the side of it. Pretty cool, love this stuff. Again, patterns in the sand, something you can certainly do at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. Take that smartphone of yours and get close, up close and personal with barnacles. It's amazing, the detail that exists in nature at a level that you and I almost never pay attention to. But if you use the smartphone or a macro lens and a regular camera, it's amazing, these micro landscapes. Um, just an old piece of driftwood, a stump, the base of a tree poking up through the snow on the beach. To me, this is drop dead gorgeous. I didn't do it, it was there. But I saw it and I like it. And the textures just really speak to me here. Tree branches covered with a light dusting of snow. Look at the intricate pattern in that branching. Fascinating. 
not really a natural picture, but the snow certainly is natural. So again, I'm always alert for patterns and textures anywhere I walk. Found this kind of cool. Um, even though this, this has an oil paint filler, filter applied to it in Photoshop, it's the only version of this that I had. It's a shot across the Bill Forward Pool at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. And I just really was drawn to the kind of the sinuous patterns created by the wind and the snow on the ice. So again, patterns and textures in nature. Let's talk briefly about landscapes because that's really most of what I do. And folks, I realize I'm running a little bit long. Nod your head if you're okay with me. Okay, all right, good. I'll get this done quickly. Winter landscapes. Landscapes are, people think, really easy to do. They're not. Um, I think it takes a fair amount of energy and talent and skill to, to make a good landscape. Um, I like this one because the tree out in that pond is off center. That's one of the things you want to keep in mind compositionally is not necessarily putting everything in the center of your frame. This is a boardwalk at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. It employs a compositional device called leading lines. In this case, it's a kind of an S curve. It could easily be just a straight line but it makes for very compelling image making because your eye is drawn in at the base of the photo and it trails off to the back of the photo. It just has a very pleasing look to it. Um, again, black and white, kind of an oddball picture in a way, but because we have this tree branch on the ground and this little uh, stream or rivulet leading our eyes into the background and because of that sort of stormy looking sky, I found this kind of interesting. So I like it a lot. Again, an anchor point in this uh, landscape. That's what that, that driftwood does for me. Um, it kind of gives, gives the image a sense of depth. Notice the leading lines created both by the edge of the sea as well as the pattern in the sun. This is a lightly uh, coated uh, dunescape at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge shot very early in the morning. I just really like it because it's got some nice color, very warm got a lot of texture, it's just a very, very pretty um, image. Shooting in the snow, if you can protect your camera, is pretty cool. Um, this is a tree that gets photographed a lot by us in Dover, New Hampshire, for obvious reasons. But again, notice how the tree is not dead center in the frame. Notice that the horizon line, in other words, where the ground meets the air, is not uh, right across the, the, the middle of the vertical frame. Typically, you don't want to do that. You want to have your horizon line typically about a third of the way from the top of the frame or about a third of the way from the bottom of the frame. If you have it right across the middle, it looks weird. Um, so just another tip to keep in mind. Again, I'm just a piece of driftwood on the Parker River Beach, um, a foreground anchor point, but the tree also acts as a leading line, drawing my eye from the lower left part of the frame off into the distance. This uh, old boat taken, I think, in Agunquip. Um, foreground anchor point, middle of the winter, cold as a devil out there that day, but again, a nice color palette, lots of textures. I really like that image. Shoot a lot of trees. Again, notice this one, frosted with snow. Could have been equally good in black and white, but this is actually a color image, uh, but it's slightly offset. It's not dead set in the middle. And again, that horizon line is about a third of the way from the bottom. Leading line created by the Parker River Refuge Road, passing by that grove of sassafras trees that people are so fascinated with. Um, again, another thing to keep in mind. Leading line, texture, patterns in nature. This one I took just a couple of weeks ago on a very cold morning, pretty stormy sea, went out to the refuge beach. It had just snowed the day before, and I found this big pile of lobster pots with a life with a lobster pot buoy. And there was just something about the color of the sky with the white snow and the, the energy of the sea that made, made this for me at least a pretty compelling image. Here's another example of looking at the vertical and the horizontal. Um, this is a shot of the Bill Ford Pool just a couple of weeks ago, I was driving down the dike on patrol and decided to stop because I saw these little swirling snow ice patterns out there on the ice. And I took a couple of pictures of it. Um, it's framed on the lower end with a non-native plant called Phragmites, which is a beautiful plant, even if it doesn't belong there. But again, um, 
I just found this kind of a compelling composition. I like the colors, I like the texture, um, sort of that swirling snow pattern create right up here, creates kind of a leading line that leads my eyes back to these uh, conifers in the background. And I just like the vibe there. I like it better than the vertical version. But again, shoot both. You may like one better than the other. So recap quickly, landscape tips. These apply to landscape photography. Make sure your horizon line is level. If you do nothing else, make it level. Horizon, generally speaking, should not be in the middle of the vertical frame. Don't cut it in half, top to bottom. Include foreground interest to add a sense of depth. Typically, landscape images have a deep depth of field, meaning they're sharp front to back. Typically, that's what you want. You do that by using a small aperture, a small hole typically around F22, F16, F11. That's really what you want in most landscape situations, not all. Consider taking both horizontal and vertical perspectives. You might be surprised. And then finally, I just want to dispense quickly with smartphones because they are probably the camera more than anything else that you and I tend to have in our pocket. So let's run down the list here really quickly. What are they good at? Landscapes and close-ups for sure. A lot of smartphones will let you get within a couple of centimeters and really create great images like that barnacle picture I showed you. You always have it with you. You're not gonna miss the photo opportunity. Limitations, they're not really good at telephoto or zooming, although they are adding telephoto optics to some of the newer cell phones, so even that's changing. They generally do a lousy job in low light. Um, and there's a whole set of reasons for that. They take great video, and I'll show you a snippet in a second here. Don't forget, they take great video. Camera and image editor and a public and publisher all in one. I'll show you an example in a minute of what I mean by that. There are some add-ons that you might want to have for your smartphone if you want to use it more and more as a camera. A wireless remote trigger, which is just a little device that you put in your hand. You put the camera on a tripod somewhere else, like near your bird feeder, and you can take pictures of the birds by not even being anywhere near them. A bracket for mounting the tripod, uh, the camera to a tripod. I'll show you that in a second. And there's a whole bunch of snap-on lenses or add-on lenses you can get. Tip, however, set your smartphone to record the maximum image quality or size you can. Because if you later want to make a print of that image, you're going to want to have the biggest file size you can. So that's important. And then look at third-party camera apps, uh, the, the actual app or software program you use on the smartphone to take pictures. Um, the, the native app that comes with most of these smartphones is a little limiting, and there's a lot of really neat things you can do, depending on what you want to do, if you, if you look into some other camera apps. I was going to mention this quickly. If you like to shoot the moon or the sunset or uh, astro astronomical starfield pictures, there are apps that will tell you when and where to do that. I'll just leave it at that. Um, Photo Pills is probably the most popular. That's why I stuck it in here. Photo Pills is an app you may want to look into. If you like editing images on a smartphone, by far and away, my favorite is something called Snapseed. It's owned by Google. It's free. It'll work on an iPhone or an Android, and it's what I use all the time when I edit my images, Snapseed. So let's look at a typical workflow. Here's a picture I took of the sunrise of Parker River with my iPhone a couple weeks ago, totally unedited. Um, and then I very quickly brought it into my Snapseed, again, on, the, on my smartphone. So you can see, I hope, that there's a difference between the image on the left, one in the middle, and then about a minute later, it was up on Facebook. That's what I mean by the full digital workflow. You take the picture, you edit it, and you can share it with the entire world, if that's your goal, within a couple of minutes. Pretty powerful. So smartphone bird photography. Upper right-hand corner is that remote control I talked about. You can get three for $10 from Amazon. They're cheap. Get one. Um, there's also a bracket for holding your smartphone to a tripod or a tabletop tripod, whatever. Um, and then here, you have the same bracket, but it's attached to something called a gorilla pod. It's got these articulating legs. It's, again, just another type of tripod. But in this case, as you can see, somebody chose to wrap its legs around a branch um, to take a picture of whatever. 
All of these things are fairly inexpensive and they can be very useful. So here's an example. A couple days ago behind the house here, I put my iPhone in that bracket on top of a light stand, or it could have been a tripod, right in front of our bird feeding station. And here's the picture they took. Um, nothing fancy. It has a wide angle lens on it. So that's why you see that distortion. But you see three or four birds right there. Had I been standing with the smartphone, there's no way I would have gotten the birds there. I would have just had the feeders. So again, I did it remotely standing in the comfort of the house. Then I wanted to set up a little close-up um, uh, a little close-up photography session using the smartphone um, in a very different way. So we put this uh, piece of plywood essentially on top of a tripod, put one of these cakes that has in it both peanuts and seeds and mealworms. And as you can see, it brought in the bluebirds like nobody's business. And luckily this bird didn't, didn't do its thing on my camera, I was grateful. But here are some of the pictures recorded by that smartphone in that, in that situation. They're pretty sharp. Really haven't done any editing. Uh, look at this red-breasted nuthatch. That's a fast shutter speed. You freeze it that, that quickly midair. I like that a lot. Um, and then lastly, and, and I, when I say lastly, we're almost done here. I wanted to just give you a quick example. We'll see if this works. Anytime I marry video with PowerPoint, you're taking a risk. But I'm going to click on a link here, and it should open up a YouTube uh, little minute and a half snippet of some birds that I shot using this setup, video mode, and hopefully you'll see it. Um, I am going to stop. I guess I had one more slide here. Ah, we have to get this in. Um, we stopped at a cemetery in Connecticut a few weeks ago, uh, looking at some ancestors, hunting for some ancestors' tombstones. And we looked up. We'd been, you know, keeping an eye out here and there for screech owls in trees. I mean, this is sort of the classic place to see screech owls in these old holes in trees and cemeteries. Looked up and thought, oh, there's one. Took lots and lots and lots of pictures of this wink, wink uh, screech owl. Then we looked at this screech owl on a computer up close and determined there actually wasn't a screech owl. What you're looking at there is the back of the hole under some sun spotlight. Um, but it kind of looked like an owl. This is what a screech owl on a tree looks like. So we were humbled, but it was our sort of uh, magic thinking that created a screech owl where there wasn't one. But this is the typical kind of image you see all over the web this time of year. Finally, I just want to thank everybody. I'll take some questions if there are any, if you're still with me. But uh, there's my contact information. I am recording this session, so we may make it available if it's of interest. Um, I've already determined for myself that we probably tried to cover, who's this we? I tried to cover too much information here. But in any event, I hope it has been uh, at least somewhat worthwhile. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to open up my chat box. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourself. Or actually, no, this, no, don't do that. Please, I, let me back up. I'm my own worst enemy. 
Let me go take a look at the questions and see if there are any. First of all, we still have 97 people here. So um, I didn't, maybe, maybe I did put you to sleep. Maybe that's why you're still here. But let me go down and just look at some of these questions. If you want to ask me a question, go ahead and type it in. And I'm scrolling down here. I think you can all see this, but I'm scrolling down. Nod your head if you can see me scrolling down the chat box. Okay, good. Matt, you deserve tons of credit. Wow, okay, I'll take that. I don't really deserve any credit, but thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, sorry, he needs to unmute us. I don't, don't really want to unmute you because there's no need to. It's nothing personal. Thumbs up for yak tracks. Okay, that's that stuff, that, that item you can put on the bottom of your feet. Uh, when farmers is on tripod, I find turning off the image stabilization. Okay. I think what somebody is saying is if you have a camera, this depends on the lens, by the way, it's not a cultural universal. Typically, if you are using a lens with image stabilization built into it and the camera is on a tripod, you want to turn the image stabilization off. Okay. That does not apply to certain camera, uh, Canon lenses, which is why I sort of hedged a little bit. Ah, uh, enjoyed learning. Good. I'm glad I didn't put you to sleep. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Platitudes are great. Uh, oh, the butterfly place in Chelmsford, Mass. is great too. It's actually Westford, uh, but yes, it's very good and it's a whole lot closer than uh, South Deerfield. Uh, where online does everyone share their amateur photography? Well, I should tell you that the refuge used to have a very active, we called it the Photographic Society of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. It really wasn't a club. It was just a monthly series of programs that we did. Uh, but there is a very, very active Facebook page called the Photographic Society of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. And if you want to see lots of bird pictures and other images as well, uh, it's very, very active. Let's see. We attach pine or evergreen branches to our bird feeder. Yep, great. Create those uh, naturalistic looking perches or scenes in your backyard, and you, you really can't create some realistic images. Uh, review the books and authors again, please. I'm um, not sure I can do that, but I will make this PowerPoint available if people want it. Just let me know. Turn off the car to minimize noise. Yes, absolutely. Ranger Pool would, would be wonderful if you did a series on wildlife photography too. Hope to see more. Okay, good. Um, would you ever consider doing a photo walk? Yes, when this COVID crap goes away. We all want to get back into the presence of other human beings. Uh, high five if you agree with that one. Thumbs up, rather. Yeah. We're going to have to be patient, though, folks. Have to be patient. But yeah, that's the goal. Um, I second the request for a Zoom photography series. Okay. Oh, Zoom photography series. Yeah, we can do that. I can talk forever. Um, Secrets of Backyard Bird, Bird Photography by J. Chris Hansen. Okay. Haven't seen that one, but thank you. Uh, will this recording be available? Yes. Because I this one I can control because I own the content. Uh, okay, other backyard bird books they're all over the web, folks. The video didn't work. Yes, I will. I will put the link to the video in the chat box in a couple of seconds if you hang on. Lovely photos, thank you. What camera bodies do you recommend for wildlife photography? Great presentation. Well, I can't endorse any brand. I'm a Nikon guy, always have been, but it has nothing to do with my government employment, by the way. They're all good. I've uh, just recently switched to a mirrorless camera, Nikon, because I already have the lenses, but uh, I love loving, loving life with a mirrorless camera. It's a lot smaller and it's my first full frame camera. So, uh, but you know, you have to pay for them. What camera bodies? Okay. Uh, link, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't mean blah, blah, blah. These are all compliments. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, do I recommend using a telephoto extender? Really, a teleconverter? Uh, well, nope, the tele extender too. Yes, absolutely. Teleconverter or tele uh, extension tubes is what I think you mean. Yes, they're both great. Absolutely. Just realize with a teleconverter, which is yet more glass you're putting between the lens and the camera, you are adding some degradation uh, to the quality of the image, and you're also losing some light. Uh, let's see. Any tips for camera settings when shooting through window glass? Use a circular polarizer, okay? Remember that? Circular polarizer will help. It's not gonna be 
absolute magic, but it will help with reflections. Really wonderful. Okay, good. Can this be made available? Yep. Um, thanks much. You're welcome. We weren't able to see the video. I will put the video. Uh, if you ha some of you hang on, I'll try and in, in elegantly go grab that, stick it in the chat box here. Or you just, yeah, I'll put it in the link. You know what I'll do? I'll send you an email. That'll be easier. Okay. All right. I think that's about it. Uh, what, what the polarizer, what is the polarizer used for long shutter speed? Um, to get a long shutter speed, you basically need to put dark glass in front of the, the lens. That's basically it. A polarizer will help make it darker. Typically, you need additional darker glass called a neutral density filter. They come in different degrees of darkness. Uh, but that's what it takes to get those really smooth. Uh, oh, let's see. And put it in there. There's your, thank you. There's your link for the video snippet. All, all one minute and 30 seconds. Uh, boy, what a compliment. Makes you want to go out and take pictures. Good for you. Excellent. Holy smokes. You people don't shut up. It's just on and on. No, I'm kidding. Anyway. Um, I think we got to the bottom. There are still 70 of you here. Thank you very much for your time today. I hope this was worthwhile. Um, this is the classic Ranger Pool thing where I tried to cram more information than I probably should have. But um, I, I am taking to heart that some of you at least found some value in it. I will find a way of posting this and I'll make it available to any of you that you, I'll just send it to you. I'll give you the link in an email. And uh, other than that, have a Phenomenal Valentine's Day. Thanks very much for giving us your time. Thanks for participating in this wonderful annual Merrimack River Eagle Festival. And uh, on behalf of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, and the Friends of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, this is Ranger Poole coming from South Berwick, Maine. Have a superb day. We'll see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>